Well, I think all of you know that the topic is uh, reconciliation. I mean, it is, it is a beautiful word, don't you think? It's a beautiful word of, of relationship, and even, even more than just relationship, uh, it, it has this suggestion that there's a relationship that's been broken, that beautifully has been renewed and restored. Reconciliation. Um, it's a very precious word to me, uh, not just theologically, though certainly rooted in, in my understanding of theology, but it is the hub of all the ministries, just about all the ministries that we engage in at Lake Avenue Church in Pasadena, uh, which is largely a, um, uh, an urban community, but actually it's kind of a mixture. We have the uh, poorest of the poor just to the north and west of us, uh, a major gang area, an area of, of, of uh, have, has the lowest socioeconomic uh, strata of uh, all of Los Angeles, except for Skid Row itself. And then to the south of us, we have the, the richest of the rich and the uh, well-educated with Fuller Seminary being within walking distance of our church and Caltech also having a significant influence both in our church and in our community. So that's the kind of church that I'm the pastor of. When I say that reconciliation uh, is at the hub of what we do, that may surprise some people, maybe not, not people here at TED's, because uh, we have often thought about reconciliation, I, I think, in, in one of two ways. Uh, if you're in my generation and have been brought up in a more traditional white evangelical church, we've thought about it almost exclusively along the vertical line, uh, that we've been broken from God, and through the, as, even as I prayed, through a great sacrifice, ultimately the blood of Jesus, we have the opportunity to be... Uh, to be made right with God and even know him as our father. And, and uh, so many times the doctrine of reconciliation has almost exclusively in uh, our context been discussed on that vertical line. And I think if we're only going to discuss one aspect of it, that's, that's the part we should uh, discuss. Uh, because with all the brokenness in our world, in my understanding, it all started in Genesis 3 when a, a brokenness happened in our relationship with God. Then everything else began to be broken. So um, some have thought about it only that way. Now, as I get a, 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 an opportunity to travel in Christian college settings especially, I found out that reconciliation usually brings up immediately uh, the notions or issues of ethnic and racial reconciliation because they are so significant. Uh, and, and they are not just in our own country, they're all over the world. Um, but when I say then that reconciliation stands at the hub of everything we do, uh, maybe I can just tell you what I mean by that. And then we'll begin talking about it. Um, what, what I understand is just what I've said, that, that in Genesis chapter 2, uh, everything was right. We didn't need reconciliation because all the relationships was right, were right. Uh, God was dwelling among his people. Uh, the, the man and the woman were walking with God. Uh, their own personal relationships within themselves, that, that was healthy too. There was no brokenness there. They were naked and without shame. Their relationship to one another was healthy and good. So that, that, that interpersonal relationship was also strong. And their relationship to the rest of creation as the vice regents of God, caring for this world that was very good, even with the opportunity to name what was in this world. So at the end of Genesis 2, uh, shalom reigns. But Genesis 3, everything falls apart, beginning with a brokenness from God, which leads to people no longer walking with God, but hiding from him and hiding lives from him, which led to further brokenness. Uh, the man and the woman began to begin, become broken by, by blaming one another instead of living in unity. Uh, their own lives were no longer transparent, but they recognized that now we are naked and ashamed and had to somehow clothe themselves, and their relationship to the rest of creation was broken. So God initiates, in my understanding, a ministry of reconciliation. Um, that when we get to the end of the Bible, uh, it, it's all made new. Uh, in in a, a different kind of a garden, uh, God dwelling among his people, uh, relationships among people restored, people from every tribe, language, and nation, one, praising God before the throne. Um, uh, the relationship uh, uh, internally of the individuals, also whole. Um, no, no tears, no, no dying all those things that rip apart a human life and the relationship to creation, human beings again being able to rule as those made in the image of God. 
So th- there we see uh, the reconciled the creation. Uh, now, the world that you and I live in, in we're not there yet. We're not there yet. And, and so it brings us back to the heartbeat of the gospel, the gospel which for me is all things reconciled in Christ, all things made new. The, the heartbeat of that is the coming of God into this world, uh, who, the, the one who engaged in the ultimate sacrifice of giving his life so that we could be made right with God and begin this uh, uh, spreading of a new kingdom that was inaugurated where the rule of this world that leads to brokenness can itself be defeated and, and God at last can be glorified that his creation will reveal who he is and that is not a God who leads to brokenness but a God of shalom and of peace and of wholeness. So, um, in the coming of Jesus, in my understanding, then the giving of the Holy Spirit, uh, he planted within neighborhoods, began to plant within neighborhoods, local churches. Local churches that were to reflect his glory and to further his work of reconciliation. And that's how we understand our role in Pasadena, California. That we are in that place where there is so much brokenness for a reason. And, and the way that we engage in looking at reconciliation ministry is this. Uh, within the, the life of our church, we recognize that none of us is completely whole now. So we are involved constantly in the reconciliation ministries that have to happen even within the body, in, in bringing together broken relationships, broken marriages, and sometimes people who have, who have fallen, uh, serious moral falls, and sometimes we have had the, seen the greatest working of God when we have... Uh, identified the sin and taken it seriously and it initiated a process of reconciliation and renewal and have experienced the grace of God to, uh, to re- restore a person to full service and to restoration. So within the body, there are many ways that this plays its way out. But out into the community then, we see that God has sent us as his ambassadors and agents of his reconciling work to further his kingdom, looking for those areas where there is brokenness, and you find it everywhere because you find it in every life. And so we uh, engage in works. I I meet with the uh, mayor of our city. I meet with the uh, uh, police chief, the fire chief, the head of uh, public education, and talk about where do you see brokenness. And I said, even though we have state church issues here in California, we have a lot of people who can be involved with you in these areas where you see brokenness in our community. And we in our church have identified several specific areas that we're involved in reconciliation work. Homelessness, trying to get people out of the pattern of homelessness uh, because we feel like uh, God did not create people in his image to have people and especially children and families not to have a place to live. Immigration, which is so significant in Southern California, so much of it caused because the economic stress of their countries and the gangs that are there have sent people out and to provide for the economics of their family. They come and work and send the money back home and try to find a place of safety. But when they come to our community, they have no place of belonging. They feel broken from the community. And we have been planted there uh, to walk alongside those in distress. It's been a challenging thing to deal with politically, but that's been the second area we have identified. Public education, uh, broken by forced busing in 1970 in which there was white flight out of the schools that has led to great distress in our public schools. We have hundreds of our people mentoring uh, students every week in the public schools, and that gets us into the families and into the areas of brokenness that are there within the families of our community. And the fourth area that we've identified is what we call reentry, because uh, California running out of money, um, uh, released from the prisons all of those who had committed crimes that were of a non-sexual, non-violent nature. And so many flooded into our cities, and we who have been working in the prisons have have sought to welcome people coming out of the prisons, finding employment, and being a place of belonging. So you see, by this, uh, when I think about reconciliation, um, yes, it is rooted in the fact that I think that God is a reconciling God, and that the work of God is to bring about a reconciliation that declares his glory in the world. But right now in this world, I I believe that a church in which Jesus is the Lord is is a church that is going to be actively involved in what God is doing, which is dealing with those issues of brokenness in our community 
And the phrase that I so often use to our people is this, when we are actually involved in ministries of reconciliation, I think God is pleased and I can feel the wind of God's spirit blowing at our backs because I tell you, it is not an easy ministry to engage in. So I wanted to start with simply sharing with you something that I would have liked to have taken the entire hour and a half to have talked with you about. But I do Timothy lectures a little bit later. But uh, I, I would like to move on to uh, my friends and to our panelists here, and especially I'd like to turn to uh, uh, Dr. Michael Reynolds. Um, Pastor Reynolds and I have been friends and partners and colleagues now for a number of years. I have had the great, great privilege of going down and teaching at our campus there and of preaching and being a part, Dr. Reynolds, of your church. And many of the things that I talked about here uh, I simply imbibed by watching what you do at the New Life Community Church and listening to you talk about things. And I feel like I'm walking in, uh, in blindness almost. I say, I know this is what God would have us to do. Um, and I've seen some of this at work in your church. Tell us a little bit about how you see this playing out in your church. And one of the things I'm especially interested in is uh, with one of the most recent demonstrations of the uh, brokenness of our society, of what happened in Ferguson, Missouri, yeah. and how your church seemed to respond to that in a bit of a different way from what we usually see in our world. I'll, I'll just turn it, go with that however you want to go. <laughs> um, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll sidestep a bit of the Ferguson first, and uh, perhaps we'll return to that because that would be a very enjoyable conversation for us to break loose as to what has happened yeah. there. But, um, there was an incident in reverse of that, or at least the philosophy was in reverse of that, to, that occurred for our church. One of the things our church has done is we've looked very deeply at Matthew 18, seeing it as scripture of reconciliation, where there's this call together of uh, when there's a break and what should we do to repair the break. Mm -hmm. And for us, it's defined to us at least three actors in the process when you look at horizontal reconciliation and you move from vertical reconciliation that God has given us a mandate that there are at least three players in the process. One may very well be the oppressor, may be even unknowledgeable to themselves that they have done things that have been oppressive. One is certainly the victim that has received the process of what has gone on. And one is the, a person who becomes a player is a reconciler. So therefore this given call of the church to be involved in the ministry of reconciliation. But all three of those people exist in, in, uh, in Matthew 18, and I think they exist throughout Scripture. And we begin to see them throughout Scripture. All three are called to be uh, initiators of the reconciliation process, whether you're the offended, the offender, or the person who is an objective carer of the things of God. And so we see, we see three actors. So there's a different message, I think, given to which one of the three actors are you? Are you the offended, the offender, or one who's trying to reconcile? And each one, there are different scriptures calling you to do something very different. And I think that's at the base of how you respond to that. What happened for us not long after the Ferguson situation, we had one of our, I'm a police chaplain, an FBI chaplain, and uh, we had one of our police officers who was uh, in a high-speed chase. The, um, the vehicle that he was chasing after was occupied by uh, four African Americans. He was a white police officer. Uh, when he, um, they stopped the vehicle and began to exit from the vehicle. In his own personal fear for his life not to be caught in the seat, which is a bad place for a police officer to be if somebody gets out, uh, he then jumped out of his vehicle. His vehicle continued rolling uh, when he stepped out at very slow speed, but it continued going. And as he stepped out, uh, the gentleman that was there uh, reached into his pants. Uh, to remove two weapons that he had in his pants. Uh, and as he began to remove the weapon, the officer then, in pursuit, in movement, shot him four times, um, twice in the face, twice in the chest, and ended up killing him. Three of the other people actually fled and got away. After the Ferguson issue, it was just, it was, there was a uh, kind of initial violent response where out data as to what had happened, about is this a continuation of violation? But the real statistics show here that this officer was really not only acting in justice, but protecting his community and protecting us and put his life on the line for us. Um, we responded, we got a, 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 a group of people from the church and went there to the police department and responded in support to the village of the act of this police officer and what they have done because 
we understood as the reconcilers. When you're, an un, when, you're, when you're an objective reconciler and people see that you don't have an issue to be won, uh, you become more credible. Yeah. And so I say in issues where uh, somebody needs to speak for somebody, the person who has the most um, equity, you might say, capital, you might say, is the one who needs to speak to the issue. And I believe God calls those people to speak to it. In this case, we possess more equity as African Americans speaking on behalf of this white officer who had fired his weapon uh, to give credibility to his accuracy to protect the community. And theologically, it was appropriate for us to have done so. I think this notion of, of having, looking at uh, three different parties at, at play in reconciliation ministries is something I've never thought about before. I hope our students write this down <laughs> because I think there's a big key of understanding what role God would have us to play in this uh, to, to, to find some wisdom in what next step to take. When you think something like the issue of Jonah who doesn't want to, uh, he, he's, he's very bothered by the fact that he has to go and reconcile with a community and, or let God's grace fall upon a community. What is he so upset about? Well, the history there tells us that his people and probably his own family had been under persecution from these people. He probably had family members lost to their persecution. And then God speaks to him as the victim and says, go let them learn of the grace of God. And, uh, and of course, he doesn't want them to feel the glory and the grace of God, but he must be an actor as being the victim. He's still an actor in the process of reconciliation. He's not even excited when God's grace falls upon them, of course, and he goes to uh, um, go and have his own pity party, and, and uh, God messes up his party a little bit, and, and uh, he's got to realize that he must be, even as the victim, he must be somebody who must participate in reconciliation, not to overlook the pain and the hurt, but to be part of what it means to gather together as an answer for the brokenness that, it, that it's attacking our world and his at the time. I have never heard the book of Jonah talked about that way. You've got to go back and change a few sermons because it seems to me that's what's going on there and can be a tremendous guide to us. Uh, Dr. Char, Dr. Neflin, would you like to add anything or speak into a bit of what Dr. Reynolds just said? Well, one thing I would say is that um, having grown up in Korean immigrant church all my life and Korean American family, uh, even after I became very serious about faith, uh, I felt this whole issue of race or racial reconciliation was something that is far removed issue. I didn't think that was part of the mission of my church, even when I was a pastor. Um, and yet, when the Los Angeles riot happened, that thrust the Korean American community right into the very, very tumultuous the racial uh, conflict that was happening. And that's when uh, particularly uh, Korean Americans or maybe Asian Americans more broadly uh, began to think, well, even though we don't have the history of being slave owners in this country or having been in slavery, perhaps there might be a particular calling, if you will, uh, for Asian Americans to enter into this ministry of racial reconciliation. In some ways, as that third party who are trying to come in and say, well, as a racial minority individuals, we do understand what it means to be excluded. So we definitely understand some pain, but at the same time, particularly for some Asian Americans who receive quite a bit of educational resources and so forth, well, what are the ways that you can also use some of that resource to really mediate this conflict that's been ongoing? Um, so, yep, yeah, maybe you're not entirely oppressed, or you're not maybe entirely oppressor. Maybe you're caught somewhere in between the two, but you still have a responsibility, even though it may not be directly impacting your day-to-day -day life. Uh, so interesting, when I, when I was listening to you about that, three parties involved in the conversation, often I think God calls us to be that mediator, even though it doesn't directly the issue may not be directly impacting your life on a day-to-day -day basis. And that is part of our Christian calling that we'll be talking about tonight, isn't it? Right, and isn't a part of this um, that once we enter into the family of God through being reconciled, through faith in Jesus right. and what he has done, 
then suddenly we see all people That's differently. Right. That's right. Th then we see the oppressor and the one oppressed as a person made in the image of That's God right. from whom Christ died. That's right. And then especially we, we also see that many of those who are going through trouble, those are my brothers and sisters. So for me to say I, I'm a, a, a party that doesn't have to get involved in this, it doesn't see the world the way God sees right. it, it seems right. to me. Yeah. So can, may I just ask you this too? You said there was a time when you didn't really think about the church having a, a major role in reconciling work. Can, can you remember why you might? Or, I didn't ask you this before. Yeah, no, probing. no. Um, so I had received amazing MDiv educational experience from TEDS. And I went through our MDiv program here in early 1980s. But I cannot recall uh, in my, uh, what I learned uh, through my theological education here uh, spending much time thinking about what we might call Christian social ethics. How do we as Christians love and relate to people who are very different than I? I think we spent a lot of time making wise biblical personal choices about my own conduct, and then we often talked about these really macro issues like the, the ethics of nuclear warfare, but I think what was often sidestepped was biblical social ethics, mm -hmm. mainly unpacking what it means to love your neighbors as you would love yourself, but then Christ defined that neighbor as someone who is so utterly so. different than you. I think, so perhaps there was that little, uh, there was a gap in my own theological education that did not confront me to look at what we're talking about as an important ministry of the church. So we're trying to fill in the gap just a little That's bit. That's right. right. I am right. so <laughs> grateful right now. No, and the curriculum too, I'm encouraged that mm -hmm. many of the faculty members on our campus are now trying to address this, yeah. both biblically and theologically, and I'm just greatly encouraged. Dr. Netlin, do you have anything to, to add? Uh, just a quick comment. I thought the um, three uh, players, three perspectives uh, was so helpful. And um, when, uh, when Mike was talking, uh, what popped into my mind was uh, the importance of perception. And uh, there's often a gap between perception and reality, except in my case, there's a perfect alignment. Everything I perceive is... <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but that's, that's the problem right there. Right we there all we think go. that uh, we have it just right. Mm. But you have the three different players three different perspectives or roles, and probably three different sets of perceptions. And uh, often when you are dealing with the uh, hurt, the break, the brokenness, the alienation of reconciliation, uh, what really matters are the perceptions. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can fight the reality battles. Mm -hmm. It's on the level of perception that uh, hearts are changed. Yeah. And uh, so I, that's, that struck yeah. me as yeah. very, very significant yeah. there. You know what seems to be very powerful about that is that Matthew 18 seems to have a way to cut through that, and it realizes that. Mm. It says, get a third person yep. to bring mm. in, and then bring somebody, take him before the church so that mm. there, there's a sense by which mm. the perceptions can be heard, and we can get to what really happened, yep. Yep. and at the same time, deal with the fact that people perceive it to be. That's right. Mm. That's right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. I, I'm, I'm going to move to a little bit of a different topic. And, uh, uh, Dr. Child, I'll ask you to, to first address this. Because I, I, as I mentioned at the very beginning, reconciliation has often been understood in our American evangelical mm -hmm. heritage as almost exclusively vertical. Uh, what I've been finding is that it, sometimes in dealing with uh, students, Christian students now, there's some embarrassment about talking about that aspect of reconciliation through Jesus and through the cross, but there is, um, we're applauded uh, by talking about other kinds of uh, reconciliation, especially issues of, of justice. Um, so I, I wondered, it, it seems to me it's hard to divorce those as Christians. Do you have any thoughts for us about a relationship between us being reconciled to God through faith in Jesus and then engaging in ministries of reconciliation. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I also observed this similar kind of pendulum swinging happening, um, mm -hmm. and uh, particularly uh, being more evident among younger 
generation, university campus ministries and so forth. But as, as we would, I think, all acknowledge and agree that uh, Christian understanding of reconciliation is really um, very much rooted in what Christ has accomplished on the cross. Um, as Ephesians 2 reminds us very powerfully, that when Christ died on the cross, he broke the walls between us and God, as well as walls that exist between different human groups that often had very conflicted history. And because of that, because of that gift, now we can live into that reality, not because of our superhuman strength, because it is something that is already accomplished and given to us. The power of the gospel that translates into reconciliation in both ways need to be fully lived out in today's life. And I think we live in a very divided, broken world where when non-Christians see that, mm. they are compelled to look into what is this power that we don't see elsewhere. Um, so for instance, as you know, I've been very involved in the InterVarsity Christian Fellowship campus ministry first as a staff worker and last 15 years or so as a board member. And what I see is that this movement is very attentive to the horizontal reconciliation as well. Uh, so for instance, right now, I think about 35% of the students who participate in the university are students of color, uh, and they do their best to live out this life of reconciliation as a witnessing community. Recently, what I heard is that God somehow used that expression of the power of the gospel in such a way that the, the, the conversion, the number of students who become Christian doubled over the last 10 years. And the number of non-Christians who are keep coming to Bible studies regularly is about 25% of all university students. Now, why are these non-Christians on a very busy university life continue to come and investigate scriptures? That compelling, winsome witnessing, that credibility, I think it really comes from that Christian community's ability to hold together and integrate their vertical and horizontal reconciliation. And I think in today's world, in some ways, credibility to be heard is very much gained when you have both very much exhibited in your community life. I also love uh, the Ephesians 2 text. What precedes that is uh, what happens when we actually fall at, at the feet of, of Jesus and, and, and know that that cross was necessary for my salvation because you, the Jew and the Gentile, they'd had what, centuries yeah. of, of this antagonism. And now here they are to call one another brother and sister and, and Paul saying this is God's eternal plan uh, to, to right. have this happen. And, but they still didn't want to be in that family. <laughs> and it pretty much, pretty much God, he says, get over it. Uh, you were dead in your trespasses yeah. and sins. All of you, yeah. <clears throat> all of you were dead. Uh, you can't earn your salvation. It is by God's grace that you are rescued mm -hmm. uh, through faith. That not of yourselves. That's a gift of God. Mm -hmm. We are his workmanship mm -hmm. created in Christ mm -hmm. Jesus, you know, to, to uh, do good works and to declare his glory. I look at that, and that is the only thing that I think provides the ongoing heart and eyes and motivation uh, to be involved in uh, peacemaking and reconciling ministries. It's that the, the arrogance of thinking us, we, we aren't like them, is broken sure. when, when we experience the grace of God. And it also reminds us, because reconciliation is such a central part of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the ministry of reconciliation is not just for a few activist types who no. want to do this extracurricular activities outside or inside the church, but it is a ministry that we are all invited and called to participate as a people of God. It's a central mission of the church. Yeah, 2 Corinthians 5, it's a little stronger than invited. It's, yeah. uh, it's a mandate, it's a mission, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's a message. It's given to us. Yes. We're his agents. Um, you know, Mike? When I, uh, as I was listening to uh, Dr. Chow, it, um, and also uh, remembering what uh, Dr. Netlin had said, the issue of perception, and you start looking at, you know, how the church has dealt with flattening out um, the reconciliation call, and in the scripture, which 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 I think is is also an ideal one for this discussion, along with Ephesians chapter two, is Acts chapter six, 
And uh, in Acts chapter 6, there's this perception that is held among the Hellenistic uh, Jews that they have been treated, that the widows have been treated as second-class mm -hmm. citizens. And I believe that's going to be a church split. I believe it's going to be a major church split. And the response of the leadership is absolutely incredible. They take what they have learned from God in a vertical relationship with him, and they practice it uh, throughout the church ecclesiology. And, and what they end up doing is saying, you know what? First of all, we listen, whether, whether it was intentional or not. They never went to, of course, the Hebrew widows had always had this plan in place. They could have said this wasn't intentional. Actually, I believe the crisis happened because the church is growing. Mm -hmm. The church has simply started including different people. Oh, that's right. And perhaps maybe the growth of the church, true growth of the church, is so inclusive that it compels us into reconciliation. Yeah. And we have no other choice unless we run out the people who are coming. <laughs> and so here it is that they, through church growth, face a problem that I think was about to split the church. But the leadership responds and says, you know, let's move into leadership those who sense, because if you look at the names, it looks like people have a history. Names, yeah. And then it says, <laughs> and then, then when he moves them into a place of power, uh, and, 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 but, but they don't get anybody. It's not the quota system, and, and, and forgive me for using these kind of terms right now, it's affirmative action. Mm. It's true, let's, you all have been overlooked in power, and perhaps we would have saw this at the table if one of you all would have been sitting at the table with us, but since you weren't, Let's move you to the table so we can hear from you, so we can respond to the hurting people that are there. They move these people to the uh -huh. table so they can hear from them. Yeah. But it's not anybody. They're not just looking for anybody full of the Holy Spirit. They have these qualifications that they had to meet. Meeting these qualifications for reconciliation, this is what happens with the church. The word grew, the priest became more obedient, and the church continued to grow. And I think those are the response of powerful reconciliation against even perception. Mm -hmm. Um, for, the, for the students who are here in our church, we have been, we're a 120 year old church, um, for about 100 years of that, a very uh, homogeneous church, a white, well educated, uh, affluent church. Uh, but our, our whole world began to change, and, and we began to see that we have to bring the gospel, be witnesses to the gospel uh, in word and deed to our community, and now our church is very, very different. Mm we began to recognize that the leadership of our church just didn't understand uh, the issues of discipleship and of life that so many of our new people were experiencing. Just, I mean, it was Acts 6 being lived out in Pasadena, California. <laughs> so we've been using that text. A great, maybe I had already heard you talk about this, but we've been trying to live that out about bringing around the table people who simply know what our people are experiencing so that we can begin to find ways uh, to address those issues of our brothers and sisters within the body. Yeah, I want to pick up on um, uh, Peter, one of Peter's points earlier, and um, uh, he's absolutely right. When, when this works in the local congregation setting, it's beautiful, and I think what you're doing in Pasadena is a wonderful example of that, and uh, Mike, your uh, setting as well. Too often, it doesn't work that way. And uh, what strikes me is um, uh, so much of society doesn't see that part of the church. Uh, I grew up in Japan. Um, my parents were missionaries. Uh, 1968, I was uh, in Japan, assassination of Dr. King, mm. the riots all over TV. I mean, uh, they were very aware of what was going on. The Japanese perception of America is that's a Christian nation. You're all Christians. Why can't you whites and blacks get along? What's wrong with you guys? <laughs> and um, uh, now on the one hand, um, every society and every people has its own problem as to how it treats other groups. And if you know anything about the uh, history of Japan and China and Korea, um, there's some deep, deep tensions there. But th the point uh, that I want to stress out of this illustration is uh, they thought we should be different. You're a Christian nation. Why don't you get along? And so if, if when they thought about Christians, uh, they immediately, immediately thought of your church or uh, Lake Avenue, uh, that'd be wonderful. <laughs> but uh, too often they don't. And, uh, and that tells me the expectation is there. They know enough about 
Jesus, what it means to follow Jesus, that, uh, well, if you follow Jesus, you ought to be different. Mm. Why aren't you different? Mm. And to me, that's a rebuke, uh, especially uh, speaking personally to myself now in the uh, white uh, evangelical community here. But uh, mm. I wish we had more testimonies like uh, your own churches, mm -hmm. and yeah. uh, I think things would be a bit different. And, and I don't know about you, Dr. Reynolds, but when I hear a church put up as, as a model, we're, we're seeking to be guided by God's Spirit. We think yeah. the Bible is, is sending us in this direction, oh, but it is so hard. Mm. It is so hard. And there are so many times when I, I keep thinking, uh, sometimes I say three steps forward, two steps back, and sometimes I say two steps forward and three <laughs> steps back. Yeah. Because uh, Jesus, Jesus let us know that peacemaking, shalom-making, reconciling ministries will be hard. Blessed are you when you do them. Yeah. Because in general, I find uh, that in a fallen world, people don't want to have yeah. peace made. Yeah. Maybe peace kept at best, mm -hmm. but actually being brought into a real lasting relationship. Mm -hmm. It's really hard. Mm -hmm. So maybe some of you will come to California. January is a really good time to come. <laughs> <laughs> but when you come, uh, you'll see us in process. Mm -hmm. Uh, this, this is what moves us and motivates us. This is what we're praying about. Um, um, we haven't arrived yet. Mm. Revelation 21 and 22 hasn't happened yep. in Pasadena yet, just in case anybody wanted. <laughs> so, um, Dr. Nathan, I want to come back to you for just a moment. I, I really wanted you to, to talk, to be a part of this because um, I knew that you would bring us a, a global perspective because the issues we're dealing with are not just here in the United States. Though, Dr. Reynolds, you made it known to me that we have some unique roles to play. And to, but still, as we were together, another point that you made compellingly to me is how hard reconciling work is going to be given the increasing polarization of our own society. Mm. It, it just seems that along ideological, political, gender lines, the polarization seems to be growing greater and greater. Um, wh where do you see in this fallen world where nothing is the way it should be? Wh where do you see the most pressing needs for reconciliation that are happening that you think the church must be aware of and, and how we might engage in it? Um, I'm, I'm not sure what I'm doing up on the panel. I, I have so much to learn in this whole area. <laughs> So I'll share my learning experience a little bit, but um, um, on, on one level, reconciliation after Genesis 3, all relationships are marred. Mm -hmm. So there's a sense in which all relationships need improvement. Um, but I'm thinking in a more narrow sense, where um, one party or one group or one individual has uh, taken advantage of, abused, mistreated others in some respect or the other. That's, that would be a more narrow focus of uh, ruptured relations and where you need uh, reconciliation. That can be in the home, husband-wife relation, parent-children, uh, with the elderly. I mean, there are a variety of contexts there. It can be in the church, power relations in, in the church, uh, theological disputes and fights in the church, in the seminary? Is it possible? Uh, I mean, there's just a variety of contexts here. And then more broadly, you look at society at large and you have uh, class issues, uh, wealth, power, gender issues, um, issues of ethnicity. And uh, this gets very complicated for us here in the United States. That's really front and center. I think it is just huge. Um, and it becomes even more difficult when you have a long history, deeply entrenched patterns and institutions that have been shaped by uh, one or more groups uh, taking advantage of and oppressing another. So, you know, where do I see the issues? Well, I certainly see the uh, issues on uh, race, ethnicity, not only black-white, but yes, prim primarily black-white issues. This, this is central. And it's a real issue for the American church, the white evangelical uh, church. Um, but then more broadly, um, Christians and Muslims all around the world. And uh, you can look at uh, various places, uh, Nigeria, uh, Somalia, uh, the Philippines, uh, Malaysia, 
uh, where you have deep tensions and very complicated issues. Uh, historically, and even in the present, Christians and Jews. I mean, there's a long history here as well. Uh, deep issues. Um, the immigration issue is, is a very important one. Um, it's in our churches. We need to deal with it in our churches. It's got the political dimension. Uh, but then it also has a deeply personal dimension. Whatever the political solution is to that uh, whole set of issues, 12, roughly 12 million, uh, undocumented here. Sorry. Yeah. It's a huge issue. Yeah. Uh, families are being... I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. These are some of the issues. Thank you. Dr. Reynolds, Dr. Cha, would you like to speak? Uh, actually, when we put the issues up, we might expect to get solution in the few moments that we have. <laughs> but, so if you have easy solutions, but where do you see it? Uh, thank you, With us so many conflicts and divisions all around, as uh, Harold has mentioned, sometimes it can seem so overwhelming for us as Christian individuals and for congregations. Mm -hmm. Where do we start? Which yeah. one do we address? And one, one way that I have uh, sort of process this is thinking of Acts chapter 1-8 as a sort of paradigm. How do, about, how do I be Christ's faithful witness of his gospel, of his reconciliation in my own Jerusalem, in my own Judea, in my own Samaria and end of the world? And for me, my own Judea, uh, Jerusalem is my ethnic Korean American church and community which has been having ongoing conflict along the generational, generational line. Lines, yeah. And that's just as tough as it can be. And from the outside, you look in and say, why are they having such a ongoing conflictual relationship when they're coming from same ethnicity, mm. same culture? Uh, and yet here it is. Uh, so many second generations have left immigrant churches because they felt so marginalized and so forth. Uh, in my own Judea, it's my evangelical world. Uh, right now, it's a Trinity Evangelical Divinity School where I've been serving last 15, 16 years. Uh, we have had history of a conflict along the gender lines, yeah. as well as race and ethnicity. How do I, as a faculty member, participate in a conversation and a practice of reconciliation in this setting? have been an important part of my own growing experience. And then Samaria is that place where it's not so far from your geographical distance, but it's another world altogether. And, and in many ways, as some of you know, um, many of us have been engaged in a partnership and conversation with churches and communities of North Chicago and Waukegan. Uh, it's our way of wanting to understand and, and, and partner with our brothers and sisters uh, what is now only 15 minutes away. How do we as a divinity school, university, partner with what you're wrestling with and, and how can you help us to become more effective in our, our understanding of reconciliation? And for me, Ends of the World was uh, recently I participated in a reconciliation conversation between Japan, yeah. Korea, and China and Christian leaders coming together to talk about, as people of the gospel, how do we talk about move forward that is different than how the governments are talking about? So the nationalism is an issue here. Now, we cannot do everything, but perhaps we can think about that call for us to be Christ's winsome witness in our own Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and ends of the world. And what might, be, what, what might that be like? for our congregations or for each of us as an individual. I think it's a good way to approach it, yeah, Doctor. Let me take another stab at that okay, that's right. and uh, come back. Um, uh, it is a deeply personal issue for me. But what I wanted to get at uh, there, uh, especially in our churches among Christians, um, what bothers me is the polarization of uh, positions and perspectives, not only on the immigration issue, but on just a whole range of social, political, ethical issues, uh, and then the demonizing of the other. Mm. And uh, I don't think reconciliation means we all agree with each other, mm -hmm. and everybody ends up just like me. That's not reconciliation. 
Um, but the way in which we uh, abuse the other, demonize the other, castigate the other, because they don't happen to agree with my position, that's wrong. And that's where reconciliation has to come in. And, uh, and I guess the last 10, 15 years, that's increasingly bothered me within the church. I mean, you're not surprised when you see that out in society. I mean, what do you expect? But when that's in the church, that's not right. Yeah. And uh, so that's, uh, we, we need a kind of civility that will allow us to come together, discuss these issues, disagree respectfully, listen to each other, learn. Uh, but we, we have deeply alienated groups within the church where we don't need that over gender issues, immigration, tax policy, affirmative action, you name it. I mean, we just split in all kinds of ways where we don't need to. I know that is true. Uh, Dr. Mal from Fuller would always talk about civility. Uh, I call it intellectual hospitality, mm -hmm. trying to welcome a, a different idea and, and to be stretched uh, stretched by it, but it is one of the most difficult mm. parts of engaging in reconciliation ministries, including mm. in the church that I'm now serving, because mm. the political polarization, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, it, uh, we're not immune to that. And so some churches are all red and some are all blue, mm. and Lake Avenue Church is a purple church. Mm. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's all I can say. So in, in the election of, the first election of President Obama, uh, we had very strong uh, viewpoints on, on both sides of this election. Mm. And uh, so I really, I had a group come to me after, after he was elected and ask if we could have a special hallelujah and praise service. And it was just a few minutes later, another group came and, and felt like the Antichrist had just been elected as, as our <laughs> president. Well, how do you, uh, that's where pastorally, you have to step in and, and, and pull uh, the veil off of the problem and say, this is happening in our, among us as brothers and sisters. Mm. And I remember when that happened, and uh, my son Brandon is here, I, I, I said, I, I don't quite know exactly what to do, except that we have to commit ourselves to walking in unity. I said, so the verse that I'm going to pull out is from Romans chapter 12, that a part of godliness is that we are going to rejoice with those who rejoice, and we're going to weep with those who weep. <laughs> and I said, if... If we, uh, if we find ourselves rejoicing when our brothers and sisters are weeping, or weeping when our brothers and sisters are rejoicing, we know the problem is us. Oh. I said, that's about all I have to say about this. Now let's go in peace. So that's uh, <laughs> trying to create as pastors an atmosphere where we can actually learn to talk to one another with civility. Uh, Paul set that example in the book of Acts by going into Athens and, 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 and dialoguing is the word. Mm talking, laying, not giving up his position, but listening, dialoguing, and then gaining a hearing uh, in some of the cities where he would go to. We need to learn that again, I believe. Mm -hmm. Dr. Reynolds, we're about ready to go to the last topic. Should I go there, or do you have something that you just want to jump in and... Go there. Okay, I want to talk about the church just a little bit. We have a, so, a number of you, maybe almost all of you, well, involved in church. Some of you are going to be pastorally involved in church. So I... I want us to think about this issue of ecclesiology. Yeah. I, I want us to think about uh, what a church is and is to be and whether there is a reason that God plants a church into a community. I, I want us to think, I don't think we talk about this enough. My son, Brandon, who is here, is an artist and, and he has forced me to recognize that so much of the Bible is just incarnational. Uh, I mean, God recognizing that the man was alone and digging his hands into the dirt. You know, uh, Tim Keller says, uh, the God who gets his fingernails dirty. Uh, the God whose prophets use very physical examples of, of things to, to make points. Uh, the coming of Jesus into this world. I mean, it's all so incarnational. And, and I have just come to the conclusion that, uh, that God's reconciliation ministry, his main vehicle of doing his reconciling work is through local churches planted in neighborhoods. Those of you called to be a pastor, it is a high calling. Uh, and, and we're there for a reason. Uh, we're there to, to, to give witness to Jesus and call people mm. to be right with God. We're there to give witness to the compassion of Jesus, who when, when lepers crossed his path or those in prostitution crossed his path, uh, cared and utilized his power to serve. 
so uh, is this not something, I mean, here I am, I'm already preaching the thing. <laughs> Is this not what it, isn't there a reason why God plants us in and isn't a central part of that that we are to be his ambassadors of reconciliation given the mandate, we're given the message and we are entrusted with the ministry of reconciliation where he puts us. Okay. Will you correct me about this, uh, Dr. Reynolds? Or, or? <laughs> Problem is I'm in too much agreement. I know, I know. It's <laughs> yeah. I, I think that we are the authors of us and we become the erasers of other. And as long as there is other, we, we, we have a problem. And I believe that what Jesus is actually doing in, by being present, this, this um, um, Emmanuel, God with us, this, this, this presence, is he's getting rid of other. Every place he's going, he's getting rid of the other. And, uh, and he's creating an us. And as long as we see other, we always see something different that we have to demonize, that we have to attack. Uh, my colleagues have been much more eloquent at defining what this means, and I've, I've learned so much listening to them. But I think that that is the call. There is no such thing as the family of God. Mm -hmm. Of course a family has arguments. Of course a family has to settle. Of course a family doesn't see it the same. But, but they're family. And so the family supersedes. So Jesus says some things when he's there that, that make no sense at all until you start hearing him create family. When, when his parents say to him, you know, virtually your family is here. And he said, who is my family? And he points at the people yeah. that are there in front of him. When he's on the cross and he tells one of the disciples, take care of my mother. Yeah. Oh, oh, excellent welfare plan. Yeah. And, uh, right. and make sure his mother's taken care of after he's gone. How can he do that mm -hmm. if the sense of us doesn't get expanded beyond his own brothers and sisters? Yeah. And so that the church must understand the depths of what family really means. And if we become part of the true family of God, we start getting rid of other and we start creating us. Because I am really hoping that our discussion on reconciliation won't make us think that the church is simply a social work agency. Mm -hmm. uh, we're inviting people into the family, and, and this has changed. We have a community meal. We feed three to 400 of our homeless people in, on Sunday evenings. And it used to be we were doing that for them. Uh, as we began to realize that that isn't what the church is, we're, we're inviting people to come into the family. But then, when, when we have our brothers and sisters not having a place to sleep and not having enough to eat, that's different. In fact, to try to communicate this, we set up a family table up on, up on the platform and just talked about uh, the difference it makes that if you see that your, your, your child or your brother or sister mm. is hungry and doesn't have a place to sleep, mm. you're going to go and walk mm. with them. Mm. And that's what the church is to be, a household mm. of faith, mm -hmm. the book of Ephesians where we do life together. Mm -hmm. And I think that the church has to be a place that embraces that. This is the answer to the immigration problem. The legal issues are still there, mm -hmm. but when you invite a person and they become a part of the family, then they're not gonna walk through those legal issues alone. Mm -hmm. They're gonna be walking with a whole family through those things. Mm -hmm. You see, calling people to discipleship, to the lordship of Christ, to sometimes very hard things, mm -hmm. but not walking alone. Mm -hmm. Um, anyway, I, I feel like that issue, I, I've been praying so much about this that in our uh, seminaries in the U.S. that we could get a, a much more robust ecclesiology of why a church exists. It, mm -hmm. It's a much more thrilling mm -hmm. way of thinking of, of a church rather than just trying to market and grow it to be big, mm -hmm. but that we actually get to be involved in God's reconciling work in the place he's put us. And as I think about particularly your challenge for us to think about church as a entity, witnessing community called to serve in a particular place. Um, last year, uh, Willie Jennings from Duke Divinity School came and gave us a lecture. And uh, in one of his uh, comments, he said, often Christian churches don't take seriously history mm. of the place. Mm. And uh, as I'm thinking about that uh, in this uh, area of reconciliation, particularly for the United States, I mean, who lived here before us? Oh. Right? And then the Native American as a people group come into a picture, uh, displaced now or melted into different places. But how do we think about reconciliation that, that our history reminds us? that there were a certain group of people here before us. And then secondly, our communities are always changing too. Mm -hmm. The demographics are changing. And is our sense of mission 
also changing with the people that God is bringing to our communities. And it seems like that has played a huge role in changing the composition of your church. But that I could also think of many churches who would refuse to acknowledge the newcomers who are making up now the members of the church. And so the composition of the church continually remained the same, regardless of mm. what is happening in the community itself. So being aware of both the history as well as just changing dynamics of the community, it seems like those two things need to uh, uh, be, we need to be attentive to as we think about what it means to be called to that place. Yeah. Can I pick, piggyback on that just a minute? Um, I mean, it's not surprising. I think the church is an impossible institution. It, you, you just can't do it without God's help. <laughs> yeah. And that's as it should be, I suppose. Yeah. But it's, it's a refuge. Uh, it's a hospital for people who are hurting and sick, spiritually and otherwise. Um, but, it, but it's also got a prophetic function. And this is where I want to pick up on your comments there again in thinking about my own context, white suburban evangelical churches, um, there's an educational function that has to take place in these churches uh, about our past uh, as Americans, uh, who we are, how we got here, our relationship with our speaking white now, our relationship with other groups, and then more immediately the changing demographics immediately around us. And you've spoken to that so eloquently with Pasadena. Uh, 30, 40 years ago, Pasadena was different. And... Uh, so there's an ongoing educating function that has to take place. Um, and then the leadership needs to lead and push the congregation uh, out of our comfort zones. And it's not fun. We don't like it. We'll resist it. But that's what the church is for. That's right. And it's not just that our communities are changing. It is our beautiful eschatological promise yeah. that the church yep. as she is is a reconciled place yeah. made up yeah. of every tribe language mm -hmm. and nations male and female mm -hmm. and that that's what we're to be mm -hmm. and I think that that call that you say even when our neighborhood doesn't change our neighborhood becomes homogeneous mm -hmm. still must compel us to go outside of our neighborhood and yeah. partner with different so that we understand us mm -hmm. And, and it, otherwise, we simply say, oh, yeah, I reflect my community. <laughs> but eschatologically, do you, connect, do you reflect your community? Yeah. And you might have to say no. Therefore, I, you know, for, for us as a church, in a very fallen way, trying to answer the question, ensures that there are people that are at least identifiably uh, bring a diversity to the table, mm -hmm. preaching from our pulpit, engaging with church and engaging in processes that we do together so that you can't use the excuse that in this five mile, 10 mile radius, it's just us. Mm. Eschatologically, it's not a good answer to mm. us. Yeah. Mm. Um, and just to let you know, when I've preached at your, your church, they, your people have welcomed this old dry white preacher so wonderfully, I'll just tell you. Well, you know, when you jump up and you tune in the middle of the sermon, <laughs> yeah. that does help. <laughs> <laughs> so. 